This is a recording from Reunions Weekend 2009 at the University of Virginia, made possible by the university's Office of Engagement. On June 6, 2009, School of Medicine Dean Stephen Dukoski presented an informative talk about the effects of Alzheimer's disease on the brain, its growing impact on our families and communities, and the progress being made in Alzheimer's research at the university and beyond. Dr. Dukoski is an internationally recognized leader in the field of Alzheimer's disease research. What I'm going to talk about today is something that I have worked on actually since I was here as a postdoc uh, a long time ago, uh, Alzheimer's disease. I started working on brain tissue from patients with AD in the days uh, when no one knew what it was. We actually didn't have formal diagnostic criteria for it in the field. Uh, we were one of six labs in the country here that was actually doing research with human brain tissue. And at one time, I knew everybody in the country who was working in the disease. Um, and of course, uh, one of the reasons you're here is because you're aware of the explosion in both the science as well as the pending demographic explosion. And so uh, let me give you a, a snapshot about where things are. And if there are questions, uh, uh, although I think we've left time at the end to do them, I know some people are going to get to march out and protest uh, at midday uh, as a function of my um, uh, uh, bad clothes in the um, in the GQ ad. So if you have a burning question, feel free to ask it uh, any time during the talk. These are my uh, disclosures, my conflicts of interest. I regret to say I don't have any that are deserving for the asterisk that says I have more than ten thousand dollars in anything. Uh, I no longer have research support. I left those behind. Uh, I also don't uh, consult for anyone regarding drugs that are on the market. These are all regarding drugs that are in the process of uh, development for uh, potential use in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I was asked to talk about challenges and hope for the future, and I'm going to do this, but I thought I would just enumerate a couple first. Uh, many of these will be familiar to you. Uh, others may not be quite so familiar. The first one, of course, which almost everyone is aware of, is that the boomers are going to have their way with America one more time. Uh, the, uh, the demographic time bomb and the, and the fiscal implications of what is going to happen when the boomers hit the age of risk for this disorder will break the federal budget all by itself. Doesn't need help from cardiac disease, doesn't need help from cancer, uh, doesn't need help from AIDS. Uh, the projection for the people who will have their evaluations paid for by Medicare and the 50% of people who in nursing homes, long-term care facilities, are paid for by Medicaid, that the projection of the number of cases of AD that will emerge over the next 40 years, uh, that's more than the budget can possibly bear. One of the reasons why uh, I'll spend a moderate amount of time talking about what are called disease-modifying drugs, or drugs that delay either the progression or the emergence of the disorder. There are a lot of barriers to early diagnosis of the disease. If you look at the bill for Medicare for a patient with AD versus a person without AD, equal age, same number of comorbidities, that is the same number of heart disease cases or lung disease cases, the bill for AD is more than twice that of people who, have, uh, who don't have the dementia, uh, in large part due to the fact that they don't take their meds, they forget, they, uh, they deny. Uh, they uh, don't pay attention to their symptoms or they don't want to tell anyone or they don't recognize the importance of it. So it's immensely more expensive to take care of unrecognized people as well as recognized people with Alzheimer's. So early diagnosis and making sure that people are taken care of properly because even people who are cognitively pretty good early in the course of the disease have problems sometimes with insight uh, that's part of the disease itself and a little bit of denial. I don't want that disease and so I'll ignore symptoms. Uh, all relate to how people, how this costs more when you have it, not to mention put you at risk of, uh, of disease that you don't want to have. Um, and uh, in research, uh, a couple of things. One that many of you may not have thought about, and that is that if this contained the drug that would actually help to significantly delay the disease, our first target is delay at five years. That would reduce the number of cases uh, a couple decades down the line by 50% because most people get the disease late in life, delay it by 10 years, delay its onset by 10 years, you could virtually wipe it out because the vast majority of people, although we frequently hear about people who are younger, the vast majority of people who get this disease are over the age of 75 and they would die of what we would call a competing mortality. That is, they die of heart disease but with normal cognition 
like not my organ, die of somebody else's organ problem, um, uh, and would not have both the fiscal cost as well as the emotional and, and interpersonal cost of having cognitive impairment. Um, so it takes time to show that the medications work, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, there are increasingly less uh, monies available for this disorder. We've just gotten the word uh, yesterday in a budget meeting at the Alzheimer's Association board uh, that the, uh, the increase in the NIH budget next year will be 1.4%. Uh, that is less than the rate of inflation for scientific uh, costs, which means that there'll be another cut in uh, usable money. That comes on top of what, for the first time in my career, happened over the last two years, which was not just a cut in the uh, spendable money because of the increase in cost of materials being greater than the increase in the budget, but actually the budget in total dollars was cut uh, over the past two years. Uh, so that um, uh, at a time when you would look to foundations and to private sources of funding uh, to supplement the cutbacks in NIH funding, uh, what's turned out to happen, of course, is that most of the private foundations also have their difficulties is because of the economic downturn, and so they also have uh, much less uh, money to give. <laughs> Companies are where we expect to make this up, and I'll talk about drugs that come from big pharma as well as from biotechs, but they also have a very cautious risk-reward calculation to do. So you know that the biggest money makers for companies in general are psychiatric drugs, cardiac drugs, cancer drugs, and neuroscience drugs. Um, neuroscience, to some extent, including psychiatry. So this would be a huge market. The market for a, a, a dr Alzheimer's drug that works is more than a billion a year. A billion a year is what the companies consider a big drug. Aricept, the most well-known drug in Alzheimer's disease, is about a billion a year, maybe a little less. But um, companies frequently shy away from this because it's hard to make a drug that works in brain disease. The brain is complicated, and companies have lost a whole lot of money uh, trying to find drugs that they were quite sure would work on the basis of mechanism, which is one of the reasons why I'll talk, why I'll, uh, why I'll talk a bit about the translational piece. There are lots of competing priorities in healthcare. Uh, cancer, AIDS, uh, heart, the biggest for <laughs> Alzheimer's disease. And just to give you some sense of proportion, um, Cancer has probably 10 billion. Cardiac's got a little less than that. Alzheimer's disease has got the equivalent of about 500 million a year in research. AIDS, I think, has 2 billion. Actually, I'm not sure about that, that, that cancer number. It may not be that high. But I know that, that, that AIDS, if you talk about the number of cases of a disease per dollar of NIH research money spent on AIDS is by far the highest and cancer and heart are much, much greater than Alzheimer's disease and lots of others. So it is an issue that you should take from them and give to this disorder. Uh, but the fact is that with the NIH monies that have been addressed, the federal research monies that have been addressed to this, there isn't enough money to do the kinds of studies that need to be done. And one of those pieces is one of the pluses. And that is, I'll show you the massive amount of research that's going on in the disease now. That's terrific. The problem is that unlike heart disease, where studies have been going on for 30 years, and when a study ends, the monies are there to roll into the next drug, there have never been federal studies in prevention or treatment of Alzheimer's disease until the last four or five years. So there isn't money from old studies to roll over into new studies. If you're going to do a new trial on Alzheimer's disease, you're going to have to either get new money, which is hard to do for all the reasons I told you about, or you're going to have to rob Peter to pay Paul and say, we aren't going to fund some of the basic research so that we can fund the clinical research. And this actually sets up some tensions between the basic researchers and the clinical researchers. So we look to pharma to help us with this, but of course pharma's got their own issues. The last issue that has to do with costs, which is dear to our hearts here at UVA, is that, um, sorry, is that, uh, uh, we have a real concern about the pipeline for clinician researchers. Uh, it's, it's hard to learn to do the kinds of things that we do where you have a physician uh, who has to learn everything to be a doc, learns about the clinical subtleties of taking care of people with the disease, learns about clinical design, and learns enough about the basic research to understand why he should do some studies with certain kinds of drugs and 
pass on things with other sorts of ways. It's a big delay in getting your, your, your self started. If you have a debt, it's even worse. Uh, so we desperately are trying to make things as easy as we can for people who want to do this kind of research. But what we tell kids off the top is, if this isn't your passion, don't do it. It ought to be an easier gateway, uh, but it's not. And that's the hand that we've been dealt. So if you've got kids who um, want to go into medicine, want to go into research, this is, there isn't anything, in my view, more rewarding than this. But uh, unfortunately, you have to fight to get there. Um, my advice is to have them inherit money. <laughs> so as soon as we're done, I want you out there making more money. <laughs> the final comment to make is that busy clinicians don't focus on Alzheimer's disease. Um, they don't get paid to do a long evaluation of people, especially a busy primary care physician, a, a family practitioner, or an internist. Uh, they don't learn, uh, usually in medical school, uh, to do the kinds of cognitive evaluations that you need to do an accurate evaluation. They don't get reimbursed if they spend that extra time. And so for many people, it's an issue of don't ask, don't tell. They need to find out about your cardiac status, your, your hypertension, and so forth. And so one of the things that I have been doing is working on little computerized tablets that let, while you're sitting around in the waiting room, uh, you take this test that tells me whether you pass or fail for saying something needs a second look. Uh, if, it's, if you pass it, you're good enough that you're probably okay, at least for another year. If you have a problem, it tells the doc, number one, here's a problem. Number two, here's where it may come from. Memory is much worse than anything else, which is an early marker for Alzheimer's, or language is a big problem, which means it may call attention to a different disorder. Uh, but we're trying to find easier ways to direct people toward care that need it because we recognize that physicians need to have things made a bit easier for them. I mean, there's just too much to learn for a doc to learn how to do what we do or what uh, geriatric uh, psychiatrists or geriatricians do in the clinic. Uh, and of course, as I said, they don't get paid to do it, so they're not terribly eager to do it, even though they want to take good care of their patients. So these are the hopes. Everybody knows about this disorder. There's virtually no one who doesn't know about this, uh, whereas 20, 25 years ago, uh, virtually no one knew what this disease was other than people who'd been to medical school. Uh, computerized testing, we think, will help facilitate diagnoses. Every one of you has got a computer on your hip now that's much more powerful than anything we used 10 years ago. And so it's going to be easy enough to find validation of ways to assess people in a painless fashion that at least comes back to the physician uh, and says, uh, here's the result, this is okay or this is not okay, uh, you need to do something about it. Neuroimaging has transformed the field, as it has so many other fields, uh, and I'll talk a bit about uh, neuroimaging and how it's changed things over the past couple of years. And finally, as I said, a, uh, just an incredible list of new medications and trials and in what we call the pipeline. And so um, I'll actually, I, I did a scan of uh, clinicaltrials.gov, and I'll give you some really astounding data at the end about how many drugs are either in the pipeline or in trials now for humans. Now, What's happened over the past 15 years has been absolutely remarkable for a disease about which we knew virtually nothing 25 years ago. Um, it used to be that uh, the light blue line was what everybody in the cognitive field said. So you live your life and you're pretty good and then you begin to lose your, your memory and then you die. Um, and that's for the more upbeat people in the field. And, and the orange line that's there reflects the fact that before anybody would diagnose you, you had to have pretty moderate uh, cognitive impairment already. And what's happened over the past uh, several years is we've backed this up. So it used to be that we would confirm or specify a diagnosis, and that would usually come after someone had declined a significant amount. Uh, after the medications emerged, the first meds in the late 1990s, you could follow patients on those drugs to see if they had an adequate response or not. And then increasingly, we have been looking backwards to say, first, can we identify people with, we, with a milder cognitive impairment who you can say have gotten um, sick, they're beyond what you would regard as a normal aging change, but they don't meet criteria for dementia, MCI. I'll talk more about it. It's a terrific place to be able to find people and insert therapy. And now we're back to what we call preclinical detection. That is, are you going to get the disease, uh, and uh, if so, uh, is there something we can give you now? How easily can we identify you and what can we give you to delay the onset of the disorder? This is uh, Augusta D, Augusta Dieter. 
This was Alzheimer's first patient. This picture of her was found in her chart from the hospital where Alzheimer took care of her in the early 1900s. Uh, it was found in the basement of the hospital in 1997, uh, completely preserved, including the slides, the recording of his interviews with her, uh, and a description of her case. Uh, she had the five areas that we now describe as being classic for the disease, a memory loss, number one, uh, language disturbances, visual spatial deficit, she, she would get lost even in familiar places. She had uh, disexecutive or frontal lobe impairments. She had impaired motivation. She had impaired judgment. She still had some preserved insight in that she kept repeating to the doctor, I have lost myself. She knew that there was something wrong with her, but she did not know very much about exactly what it was. And she also actually had a neuropsychiatric presentation. She had pathological jealousy of her husband. Uh, she also thought that Alzheimer was going to cut her or hurt her. Uh, psychiatric uh, symptoms we have come relatively late to recognizing. We've all been focused on the cognition part. Uh, and now there's a great deal of research on the behavioral aspect as well. The interesting piece of this is that the anatomical uh, uh, correlates, the neurochemistry, the circuitry, we understand about the disease. And, I'll, and I will tell you uh, more about that now. That's been one of the great gains of the past uh, uh, 15 years. In 1976, a neurologist who at the time was the chair of neurology at uh, Einstein in New York, Bob Katzman, later went out to uh, UCSD to become the head of their neurology department and direct an Alzheimer's center out there, kind of the equivalent of the Dodgers moving to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Los Angeles, wrote an editorial in one of the neurology journals, kind of an obscure thing that only people know about, where he predicted exactly what's happened now. He died about a year ago, a very honored senior physician. He predicted that there would be a massive increase in the number of cases of Alzheimer's disease in the 21st century, and that we needed to get busy now doing something about it. You see, he wrote this in, in 76, and with his work and the work of a number of other people, I was a resident at that time, um, he, uh, he, he marshaled a lot of the political support that led to the development of the National Institutes of Aging and subsequently to the development of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers, of which there are 30 in the country and a lot of other places, part of a network that do research. And the reason that he wrote this was because a study in the late 60s and proceeding into the 70s had shown that in the, in the first large-scale study of people who died in nursing homes with dementia or without dementia, that the people who had dementia for the large part had plaques and tangles, the two hallmark changes of Alzheimer's disease brains, I'll show you these in a second, were present in the cases that were demented except for the cases that had big strokes. The people who didn't get demented, but who died in their 80s, had relatively clean brains. And the problem was that they looked at these brains. Uh, this is uh, Sir Martin Roth. He was knighted by the Queen for this work several years later. The problem was that there wasn't any difference they could find between the brains that they were looking at of these people that had senile dementia or arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries and any of these things that happened when old people got demented and the cases of Alzheimer's disease. So if you look still in the 80s in old textbooks, you'll find a paragraph or two about this rare neurodegenerative dementia of midlife, which is what Alzheimer's disease was known as. Uh, but it wasn't until they put together these findings from the British studies that were done in Newcastle uh, in Great Britain that people realized that what was happening to old people, she just happened to have been an early case who was identified and then came to autopsy at Alzheimer's Hospital. And by the way, like many of the things I'll show you, Alzheimer was the recipient of, or the beneficiary of new technology. Because the stains that he used on the brain tissue to show the abnormalities, I'll show you one of his, I think I have one of his originals in here, was a new stain that used trace metals, heavy metals, silver, uh, copper, other kinds of stains that had never been used before, but were sweeping across Europe in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he took those new stains, put them on her brain, and that's how he saw the plaques and the tangles for the first time. So this is what happened uh, 25 years ago now to, to activate the spark that said, geez, we need to do something about this. This is not uh, a rare disorder. It is the major cause of disease and late dementia in late life. And this is uh, modern uh, data on what's going to happen. And I've split into two colors because this is a number, estimated number of cases. You don't actually have to pay much attention to the raw numbers because there's a lot of, uh, of, of discussion about what the actual number of cases is. Generally, the association talks about this as 5 million or so now, but it depends on whether you take uh, estimates from the census that are from their high, median, or low averages. The slope, however, is accurate. The slope says, because we know 
what prevalence of disease there is in each age group above 65, this is real. This is what's going to happen as far as the increase. It will more than triple. And the purple cases show you the severe to moderate to severe cases. So these are the cases who either you quit school to take care of your patient or sorry, quit work to take care of your patient, or you hire someone to take care of them full time because they can't be alone, or you put them in a, in a chronic care facility because they can't be left alone. All of which are, of course, much more expensive than people who have mild disease. So altogether, it's a massive toll, interpersonally and socially, uh, but in fact, the cost of this is absolutely immense. The dementia burden in the United States Probably, we generally say between 5 and 10% of people over 65 have Alzheimer's disease. Depending on what study you look at, if you live to be 85, you've probably got somewhere between a 30 and a 40% chance of getting the disease, even without a family history. This is one of the reasons why the danger is coming, because the population of 85-year-olds plus in the U.S. will quintuple by 2050. People are living to be older. The mean survival once you get this, although it obviously depends on how old you are when you get the disease, is around 8 to 12 years. And the reason that it's so vague and long is because people get this disease in their 60s and 70s, and people also develop this disease in their late 80s. So their actuarial life expectancy is different anyway. But in general, especially because people who come in are younger with fewer uh, other disorders, the people who come into specialty clinics, 8 to 12 years is a range. And it contributes over 10% of all years lived with disability. Quality of life years is a, a, a statistic. Qualities will be something you'll be hearing about increasingly because this is part of the, 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 the balance about how we should spend our health care monies on disorders that would let people live quality of lifetime as opposed to, say, stretching someone out who is extremely ill and doesn't have any meaningful quality of life uh, at great expense. Generally, uh, the numbers are creeping up toward $150 billion a year now, and this is before the tripling of the loss. Uh, and a variety of other issues, including, as I mentioned before, impact on the management of other diseases. It's hard to leave somebody alone to take their own medications who cannot remember to take them. And if they don't have insight and don't believe they really have much wrong with them, it's even harder to get them to let you, you know, remind them or have somebody come in to give them a pill. And those are things that families greatly struggle with. Right now, we've talked about the presence of the absence of the disease, and what I want to do is, is show you how we differ in how we view the disorder now. So we don't think about this disease as you suddenly appear in the office with dementia, which is actually what happened in the 70s and 80s. It would take so long to figure out, oh my gosh, something's really wrong with someone, that by the time somebody came into a specialty clinic, they were really demented. There was no, when I think about the people that we sort of struggled to say, hmm, is this Alzheimer's or not, in the 80s, you know, in, in three minutes now, we not only know they're demented, but also what they have. But this is where we view things now, that you're all over on the left, you're normal, you have, you're super normal, you're UVA grads, you, you have no disease, you have no symptoms. Our patients are all over on the right, they have Alzheimer's disease, and we treat people with Alzheimer's. They've got diffuse changes in their brains, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But how do you get there? And this is much more how we review the disease now, especially talking about either finding it early or finding people before they are even symptomatic. At some point, you been, begin to develop the pathological changes in the brain. So you're in group two, pre-symptomatic. You have some plaques and some tangles and some biochemical changes, but your cognition's completely normal. In both of those cases, the first two, anything we would treat you with is what we call primary prevention. So giving you a vaccine for, uh, for pneumonia to prevent you from getting pneumonia, any kind of vaccinations, those are all primary prevention types of, of uh, interventions. Mild cognitive impairment means the disease has broken through in its earliest stages, but you're not severe enough to meet our current criteria for the disease. And for that, we would use what we call secondary prevention just like taking an aspirin for a heart attack after you've had your first heart attack. We know that that decreases the chance that you'll have a second heart attack. So this is where we look at the world of disease now. It's very much of a process of becoming, a process of movement, as opposed to the sudden appearance of somebody in the office with disease. And even after someone with moderate disease presents, especially for the future when we have disease-modifying drugs, we'll be looking at their rates of change over time to see whether or not, in fact, any dis uh, disease-modifying drug we gave them gets enough traction that it actually slows down the progression of the disorder. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the technical pieces, but these are more guides for me than anything else, and you can just sit back and listen. why so I tell the students, you know, they have all the notes and everything. Just listen to the story. Alzheimer's saw most of what we know about the disease now. He got brain shrinkage. He had a, a shrunken or an atrophic brain. He saw the neuritic plaques. He was the first person to report them. He saw the neurofibrillary tangles, which are these globs of protein material irreversibly bound to itself, kind of like a fried egg, never is going to become an egg again, in the brains of the patients, the silver stains especially like those neurofibrillary tangles. Um, he saw that there were areas of the brain that didn't have as many cells in them as they should have by his sort of look at what, you look at a lot of cortices, you know about what the density of cells are. He knew cells were gone, so he got the normal death. He didn't know about transmitter deficits, the chemicals that communicate cells between each other because they hadn't been identified yet. Uh, and he didn't know about the cascades, that is what we think of, again, think about this as progression or movement, where kind of like a small snowball dropped from the top of a hill rolls down and becomes something gigantic. That's sort of the way we look at much of the pathology of the disorder uh, and how it strikes. So these are the bad boys. On the left is a neuron that you wouldn't see if there weren't neurofibrillary tangles in it. This is an immunofluorescent stain, and it's only showing uh, things that uh, have a particular structure to them that will reflect back light, fluorescent light. Uh, you can actually sort of see, if you squint at it, that the nucleus of the cell doesn't have any, I think that still sort of stands out, the nucleus of the cell doesn't have tangles in it. It's only out in the cytoplasm, the cell uh, uh, body itself. But there shouldn't be any of this material in there, and it's filled. On the right is this sort of death star that we call the amyloid plaque or the neuritic plaque. You'll sometimes hear it called an amyloid plaque because at the center, that bright white spot is compacted amyloid, a peptide, a small protein, 42 amino acids long, that is a part of a bigger molecule, and I'll show you how it gets to this. And what happens is at some point the brain looks at it and says, whoa, this should not be here, and it attacks it. It brings in inflammatory cells called uh, macrophages, and bring, uh, in the brain they're called microglial cells, activates its own support cells called astrocytes because they sort of look like stars, uh, and in the process of trying to eat the amyloid, which it cannot do, it's unable to do it, uh, it destroys a lot of tissue around it, which is normal tissue. And so if you stain this for neural, normal neural pieces, I've said in there, it's just degenerating synaptic processes, those are the normal connections, the normal wiring that it destroys in its effort to eat this material. On the right, you can see uh, just the amyloid deposition. There's no inflammation that you can see here. It's just the antibody. But every one of those sort of yellow flame-like structures you see is a neuron. That's why they're called pyramidal neurons, because they sort of look like pyramids. Everyone is a neuron filled with this material, which is completely inert and, and highly cross-linked to itself and will never be undone. We won't ever dissolve these in humans. It would be like trying to unfry an egg. We have to stop them from getting worse, which is one of the reasons why there's an emphasis on early detection. So I told you there's a snowball that rolls downhill. We think the start of the snowball is something that goes wrong with metabolism of a protein called APP, or amyloid precursor protein. Uh, and there are a bunch of reasons for that that we can get into if you'd like. We think it initiates the damage. We know that in experiments it can injure cells or lead to their death or lower the threshold for their dying. We know that normally the brain clears this peptide. It's called soluble amyloid at that point because it's in the extracellular fluid of the cell. We think the trip for, al for Alzheimer's disease in late life is that humans stop removing it as effectively as they should. And so it builds up in the brain, and it eventually aggregates itself into these plaques. Hurts the brain both while it's in its soluble form, because it's higher than the concentration that's normally present. Remember, this is a normal protein. You all have small amounts of uh, amyloid, beta amyloid, in your blood and in your brain. <clears throat> but it builds up to a high enough level that it becomes toxic. So we think that it, it has reduced clearance. And then the big key, uh, for the arguments in the field that, that overtook us for 20 years, are tangles and plaques, which both show up in the disease, which one causes the disease and which one is worse? And the answer is, it's probably not a useful question when it comes to treatment, but we think that amyloid starts the disorder and leads to these abnormalities and tangles. And the reason we think this is that the people who get this disease because they have a mutation in one of their genes, there are three different uh, proteins, a mutation in which will cause the disease. One of them is the APP molecule, and the other two are related to the enzymes that cut the APP molecule that leads to this little, uh, this little fragment, this little snippet. So all 
uh, mutations that lead to Alzheimer's disease all involve amyloid metabolism, and all the mutations have tangles in them as well. If you mutate the tau gene, which is the protein tau that becomes the neurofibrillary tangle, you don't get Alzheimer's disease. You get a different uh, dementia called um, frontotemporal dementia. So for all those reasons, we believe that, that, that the tangle change is secondary to the changes in amyloid. Haven't proven this yet, but the evidence is pretty strong. The last piece of evidence, by the way, for those of you know about this, is in Down syndrome, or trisomy 21, where they have an extra copy of the long arm of chromosome 21. That's where the APP gene is, on the long arm of chromosome 21. So virtually all patients with Down syndrome have an extra copy of the amyloid gene, and all patients with all people with Down syndrome get Alzheimer's disease changes in the brain by age 40. They don't all manifest dementia. Many do in their 50s usually, but they all get both plaques and tangles. So they've got an extra dose of amyloid. They get plaques, but they also get tangles. So that's why most people think that the path is from amyloid to tangles. What makes tangles still so important is, for a variety of reasons we can talk about, the amyloid plaque, although I told you brain damage occurs with it, that's related to uh, some direct co correlations with cognitive impairment. But the strongest correlations with cognitive impairment of those two are with tangles. They never go away. And the disease continues to progress. It looks like plaques get up to a certain level, and then they kind of stay even in the brain. And in fact, they can be pulled out by therapies, which is one of the things that I will show you in a minute. So this is everything I told you, and there's only three things to know. One is, out of this whole thing, I, I use this for student lectures, but it's, it was easier just to tell you what to pay attention to than uh, assuming you'll listen. But I've been in GQ, so you should listen. So the only thing you want to know are, are three things. One, this is the molecule. It's a belated grass. Here's the root. Here's the part that sits up above the surface of the lawn. And here's the part that's inside the interface between the dirt and the air. Um, normally what happens is the molecule gets cut right here uh, by an enzyme called alpha-secretase. Alpha because it's the first place and the right place to be cut. Secretase because after it's cut, it floats away into the extracellular fluid. So it's secreted in a sense. But the problem is that the orange length that you see of this molecule is what gets built up in the middle of the plaque, which means that that cut never occurred. And that there must be two other secretases or cutting enzymes that cut it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the orange piece. So they were both predicted before they were found, and now we know what both of them are. One of them is called base, or beta-secretase, which cuts at the higher end of the, uh, of the grass uh, clipping there. And the other is called gamma-secretase, which cuts in the middle of the membrane, which is absolutely uh, against all dogma that you could cut a protein in the middle of a membrane, but it turns out that this complex does. And then this is what gets released. And it turns out, I told you that mutations in this protein will cause Alzheimer's disease. The gamma secretase, that is the enzyme complex that cuts this, is made up of four different proteins. And they have the easily remember, rememberable names of, uh, of presenilin-1, PEN2, AF1, and nicastrin. <laughs> nicastrin was discovered, a mutation caused the disease. Nicastrin was found in the city of Nicastri, I think, in Italy, which is why it's called nicastrin. Presenilin-1 ought to tell you that it causes presenile dementia. I have nothing for you for PEN2 or F1. I mean, they, they, they're abbreviations, but they're meaningless. But a presenilin-1 mutation causes Alzheimer's and, in fact, is the most common mutation that leads to autosomal dominant uh, Alzheimer's disease. So if you watch uh, The Forgetting, which is one of the PBS broadcasts or the recent HBO broadcasts about this disease, the families with familial Alzheimer's disease that... Uh, uh, we were featured in the, in the, from the Pittsburgh site. These are families who had the PS1 uh, mutation. So again, all roads sort of lead to amyloid as the primary cause of the disorder. And what I'm showing you over here is that these little pieces float out. They can do their own damage. They, become, they clump to each together. They're sticky. This little 1 to 42 is sticky. Becomes a dimer, becomes a trimer, becomes an oligomer, what we would commonly call a polymer. You know, the repeating same thing after. And then that's what forms fibrils and then eventually a plaque. And then the brain goes, aha, this shouldn't be here. Let's get rid of it. But the reason it piles up is presumably because it isn't being removed as quickly uh, or as efficiently as it used to be. And all of this is just to say that what we're trying desperately to do, kind of like that 
initial uh, linear time thing I showed you before, what we want to do is match up when all of these changes occur with what the clinical status of people looks like, because that would tell us not only where to intervene, but also with what sorts of anti-amyloid drug or anti-Alzheimer drugs we'd want to intervene, depending on how far down the line the person is. I told you that 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 uh, neuroimaging had really transformed this disorder, and uh, as it has many other diseases. But it's really pretty clear, especially if you've lived through the development of these different imaging devices. So in uh, the 70s, computed tomography or CT scans came out. And up until that time, unless you did an autopsy or a brain surgery, you never saw the brain tissue with any of your studies. Angiograms showed you the blood vessels around the brain and pneumoencephalograms where you would actually inject air into the base of the spine, let it rise as it would to the top of the head. Now it's not a very pleasant test. Everybody can get pretty sick afterwards, uh, get nauseated because the brain doesn't like having its lining irritated too much. And we don't do this anymore, by the way. We stopped it. We stopped when CT scans came out. It would show you what the ventricles looked like and what the, 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 the cracks between the brain surface things looked like. But you did this if you just had to know. The point was, though, it was just the brain was the shadow. You could see the air, but the air was not in the brain tissue. CT scans, for the first time, let us actually see brain tissue. Changed the whole field. Said, if you've got a tumor, causing your cognitive impairment, we, we, we can see it. If you've got hydrocephalus, uh, an obstruction that's letting the fluid-filled sacs blow up, we can see it. Uh, if you've got a big stroke or multiple small strokes, we can see it. MR scans came along in the 80s, and they gave even better resolution, a much clearer picture of the brain. They also were much more sensitive to vascular changes to tell you if you had small vessel disease, which CAT scans in those days at least didn't pick up as easily. And of course, the CAT scan involves uh, radiation, whereas the MR scan, as far as we know, is harmless. And then what happened was we learned how to do volume determination. That is, we could look at any area of brain and say, how big is this? And in a disease caused by shrinkage, where if you had a drug that stopped the disease from coming, you'd want to know that it stopped the shrinking over time. It was a hugely valuable and powerful tool for us. And then along came what's called co-registration, which is why that green brain is there. That we got to the point where in virtual space on the computer, you could take the scan that was done in 2007, repeat the scan in 2008, co-register them, and subtract the difference between the two, and see whether there was change, and was the change things getting bigger or smaller, and compare that to people who were normal to say, is this faster or slower than people who are cognitively normal. So that brain with the green, the green areas in this person with Alzheimer's disease shows you over two years the regions of the brain that are shrinking faster than the normals of the same age. And the red area, which is the ventricles, bright red because they're getting bigger because the brain tissue is shrinking. So we've now gotten to the point of MR where at the bottom, wherever you see the blue disappearing, those are regions of the brain that are shrinking faster than age match controls. And those pictures are taken six months apart. So we have that degree of being able to look at somebody six months or a year apart and determine with relatively high sensitivity whether their brains are moving or not. Now, why would we bother doing this? Well, we need a book of people and what their rates are because what we'll do with clinical trials, and we're doing now with the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, is say, if we give you a drug, versus those who don't get the drug, do we slow down the shrinkage? Do we change? Do we stop it? Settle for slowing it down at this point. And then, these are all structures. These are images of activity, brain activity. So at the top, a not terribly uh, uh, frequently used test, but a very real one. That's the brain of a person. Their eyes are looking up. The, they've been sort of uncapped at this level. This is a PET scan uh, with glucose. Glucose is the major energy metabolism uh, utilizer in the brain. And it should be red all the way around, saying it's really, really hot. There's no energy use, of course, by the fluid-filled sacs. That's why they're dark and blue, just like these openings here. But in the back here, you see that it's less red. And that means that that area of the brain back here, what are called the parietal lobes, aren't as active as they should be. And that's a signature for AD. It's not a specific signature, but it's a, a very well-accepted uh, indication, especially if the rest of the picture looks like Alzheimer's disease. So as that changes over time, we'd also like to know that we slow down or stop the loss of energy metabolism in the brain. It should correlate with cognition. Perhaps the newest, and I'll talk more about this, is the one at the bottom right. There, the yellow and the red 
mark amyloid plaques in living humans. Uh, a remarkable finding. This is called Pittsburgh Compound B. My colleagues uh, at Pittsburgh, Chet Mathis and Bill Klunk, spent eight years finding the right compound. There are now four of these in the world. Two of them will probably be winners. Uh, one from Avid Pharmaceuticals and this one, which GE owns the rights to. By the way, I have no regret to say I have no, uh, no uh, financial interest whatever in this uh, compound, but it is a great tool for the world. Klunk and Mathis, by the way, just as a footnote, when they had Pitt do the licensing deal with GE, insisted that any academic center who wanted it could use it for free. Uh, if you're a drug company, uh, you've got to pay GE. But um, uh, there are 40 places in the world now using it because we'll send them all of the information they need and all the technology. And if you want to fly Mathis to Japan, I'm sure he'll be happy to go. Uh, but uh, it's available free, which is why it's in use now all over the world. A terrific uh, model, we thought, for everybody else. This is where the, in the brain, this is where the outline of this material is. So the neurofibrillary tangles are at the top, and the labels didn't show up, and the, ta and the plaques are at the bottom, and there are just two things to note. The first is that there's a big difference in how dense different regions of the brain are. So that bright orange area that you see, bright red rather, uh, at the top, that's the uh, neurofibrillary tangles in the hippocampus, which is the human RAM chip. That is the area of the brain which is required for recent memory function. But you see other areas of the brain, including the visual cortex, which is at the back right there, and this area here, which is the motor system and sensory system. You see very little here. These are unaffected in Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's patients don't get weak like ALS patients do. They don't lose sensation like people with uh, uh, sensory degenerative disorders do. This disease, where the tangles are, you get disease, and where the tangles aren't, you don't. Plaques, on the other hand, are much more evenly distributed. You can see the color range at the bottom here. But there's very few plaques, actually, in the hippocampus. Uh, but look at all the tangles in there. So the other thing to note is, in addition to the difference in how much is in different regions, they don't match in where they are. Just puzzled us for a long time. Now we think we know the answer. First, we now know how this stuff forms. That these are data from uh, still the court. These are data from Paris. Uh, the Germans have identical data. It's not often the Germans and the French agree, but they do agree on where these things occur. And what you can see is this stuff spreads from the temporal lobe, right beneath your temples here, uh, out onto the cortex in the temporal lobes, and then up onto the top of the brain. And the temporal lobe, as I told you, the, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex are the heartland of your circuitry for short-term memory. So it goes from there up onto the other areas of the brain, involving the areas associated with naming, with finding words, with identifying people's faces, uh, with language, uh, but in a remarkable sequence. Plaques, on the other hand, remember that, that plaques start out by being a soluble material that builds up in its concentration until it begins to fill plaques. And when you see them, you see them in the cortex. That's at the top right there. They are the first things that form in phase one. You see them in cortex, and then they spread down into the rest of the brain. This is, we don't know why. It's probably a function of the balance between how much of it's made and how, how fast it's removed from different areas of the brain. But it's a reflection of the fact that this isn't as focal as a problem inside a neuron. This is probably a measure of the fact that the material begins to aggregate at different rates in different places, but the first place it aggregates is up in the cortex, probably because those are areas that don't have as effective a removal as areas down lower. So what, how would you approach this for treatments? We, we generally divide treatments, and they're artificial. It breaks down, if you ask about it, into symptomatic, that is, can you make somebody better acutely, and disease-modifying. Can you alter the, the pathology of these cascades slow down the path, and then slow down the behavior that, of course, should follow from the pathological change. Neurotransmitters, there are two that have been approached so far. One is called acetylcholine. This is truly, uh, if you've got one neurotransmitter that's associated with, there are really two, glutamate and acetylcholine, but this one's clearly associated with memory function, and you all know this if you're over a certain age. One of the reasons that you're told when you're older not to take Benadryl or scopolamine, the transderm scope, or um, uh, meclizine, uh, anivert, uh, is because it blocks this transmitter, acetylcholine. And in men, because as you get older, you lose a little bit of, acetyl of cholinergic function, it can stop your uh, bladder function. It certainly makes you sleepy, which is why Benadryl 
uh, or um, diphenhydramine is in Tylenol PM and Nitol and all of these over-the-counter drugs, but interferes with this system. So this system is associated with being sleepy or with being alert, and it's also associated with short-term memory function. So we know that the system, the cells that make this compound are decreased. If you lesion this in animals, they lose their memory. And so the major drugs, three of the four major drugs that are in use now, boost the activity of this transmitter. So Aricept, Razidine, and uh, um, Exelon all boost up levels of acetylcholine. And glutamate, uh, which is a, another transmitter, it's also it's just a, a, a tiny uh, little molecule, also is associated with memory function, and with, it's one of the major neurotransmitters in brain. And the fourth drug in Alzheimer's disease is directed at um, helping regulate levels of glutamate neurotransmission in the brain. It's more data than I wanted to give you, but it explains the drugs, which I'll show you in the next table. So this is the lineup in 2009. It's been unchanged for a long time. We don't use Cognex anymore or Tacrin. Uh, you had to give it four times a day. It has significant liver toxicity. It, it'll make you throw up and be nauseated and have diarrhea like a champ. And in the end, only about 30% of the people who took it could tolerate it well enough. But if you could do that, it clearly did help over time, boosting levels of acetylcholine. Aricept or Dinepazil was the next one out the door. Came in, I think, and approved in 97. Still the leader. It's got about 75% of the U.S. and European markets. Uh, you could take it once a day, which was a help. It, it, probably fewer than 10% of people have trouble with the big side effects. Exelon or rivastigmine, uh, you had to take twice a day. There's a patch formulation now. Uh, it also works. It's probably got a few more side effects of GI side effects than Aricept does. Uh, galantamine, which was brought out as Reminil in 2000, around 2000, I think, and now it's called Razidine because the FDA said this is too close to Amaryl and, and people can't read doctor's prescriptions and we're giving diabetics uh, the wrong drug and we're giving Alzheimer patients the wrong drug. So they made them change the name to Razidine uh, at the same time that they allowed them to put out an extended release formulation. That was the quid pro quo, which is why you may see it in two different names. And all three of these, n nobody's tested them head to head. It's, the drugs are usually picked on side effects. Aricept's got the fewest side effects, and that's usually why people use it. They all work. No question they all work in, in, in big trials. Memantine or Nemenda is approved uh, for moderate to severe disease, and it's the one that works on the other neurotransmitter systems. And although they haven't been able to show definitively that it works in mild disease, uh, almost all the people I see have already been thrown onto it in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. Um, so, and because and, you can take memantine with any of the other drugs, and most people uh, insist that their family members be put on both, even though we don't have data for mild uh, Alzheimer patients. Memantine, fortunately, is a pretty side effect free drug, so it isn't that much of a problem. These are the common side effects of these drugs. Uh, they often cause people to decrease their appetite, uh, along with the nausea and diarrhea. Sometimes they'll cause muscle cramps. They can cause vivid dreams or nightmares. Uh, people, be, to avoid the, the, the nausea, the doctors were told, give it at night. Uh, but because the sleep systems also involve this transmitter, acetylcholine, people would report these really vivid dreams and sometimes nightmares. And when Aricep came out, he said, look, take it in the morning and see if you can tolerate it, because 90% of people don't have any problems. And that decreases the likelihood that you have a, a nightmare. So if you've got a family member or a friend who said, Vivid dreams or nightmares are a problem. Ask them what time they take the drug and tell them to talk to their doc about taking it in the morning. And rhinorrhea, that's a runny nose uh, for those of you who don't want to be billed the 50 bucks. <laughs> uh, rhinorrhea also is a problem because that transmitter is also associated with um, uh, uh, the perfusion that, that, that allows mucus to, to be released. The sprays that you take are often things that block uh, this transmitter as well by uh, blocking down the uh, blood vessels that that help to put in it. But rhinorrhea is sometimes a terrible problem for people. They don't want to have the rhinorrhea, but they don't want to drop the drug. So their answer is you, you keep a tissue with you. So future symptomatic therapies. That's all we got right now. So these drugs are rumored not to work. They absolutely do. There's no question that when you put 50 patients on drug and 50 patients on placebo, the drugs work. The problem is that um, in an individual person, it's much more variable. And if, in fact, it slows down the clinical, apparent clinical progression slowly, 
you know, how hard is it for families to notice that? What they want to know is, I want to take this pill and I want my mom back. And none of these drugs are, are that powerful. There's one drug really to tell you about. You'll be hearing more and more about this. It's a drug called Demibond. It's got an interesting history. It was sold for a long time in Russia as an antihistamine. Turns out it's not a terribly powerful antihistamine. Uh, but it also was reported to have a whole bunch of other chemical activities. And then, um, for some reason, uh, a study was done, perhaps because it had weak cholinesterase activity, which is what the activity is that the three currently approved drugs have. So they tried this in 10 centers in Russia, which had never done trials before, and got, I think I put some, yeah, and got some remarkable data that was presented uh, about a year ago at the International Alzheimer Conference. Um, about 70% of the people who were on the drug at the study end of a one-year trial with mild side effects had this kind of change over time. So that's, that's a year. And this is usually how these are plotted. This is time. This is the number of people at each point. You can see everybody, people drop out of trials like this. Here are the people on the sugar pill, blinded, so they don't know what they're on. And uh, this is about a five-point loss on the ADAS COG for a year. That's almost dead on average for what we have studies in the US. But as you can see, the people who got the active drug were actually still above baseline a year later. So, there's always a bias in these drugs because people who are proceeding downhill fast drop out because they assume that they're on the placebo. And so if the drug works or not, we don't know. So there's always a bias toward people who are slower progressors believing, aha, I must have the drug because mom's not changing very much. Those people stay in. That's a pretty impressive change uh, for a drug without much side effects. And again, uh, well, that one's not helpful. Here's activities of daily living. Again, not huge changes, but there's no question there's noise in this drug. This drug's doing something. And oh, that was the only one I put in. Okay, so this is activities of daily living, which many families care about whether or not you can do better on a paper and pencil test. So we don't know what to do with this. Uh, it turns out it probably works in the energy metabolism of the cell. And now it's under evaluation in a uh, uh, trial in the United States and Europe, a phase three trial, a big trial, lots of people. Uh, which will probably be over in another year and a half, and we'll know whether or not there is another drug that looks like these data are better than the data from the currently approved drugs. So we will see in a year and a half whether or not this drug works. The one thing we know is it isn't working like the drugs that we have now because its activity is so weak that at the doses they're giving, it's not having an effect. Uh, the doubt about the drug comes because it was done in Russia by Russian docs who had never done clinical trials before, and they're complicated to do. They're not easy. The flip side of that was they were trained by Rochelle Duty, who is a, a director of the Alzheimer's Center at Baylor, who is a very smart and capable uh, uh, clinical trialist. So they had some trouble getting support, but in the end they did, and now there's a big trial up, and we're all waiting to see whether or not this will help us until we have drugs that really nail the, the, uh, the disease more directly. That's the one big symptomatic drug that's probably worth knowing about in terms of hope for the future. We've had our hearts broken before in the field, so. I'm going to show you one of the heartbreaks in a minute, but this one's one to keep your eye on. You'll hear more and more about it, Dimabon or Dimabon, depending on how people decide to pronounce it. I showed you this slide before. This is about the amyloid cascade, and this is where most of what are called the disease-modifying therapies are coming from. The most powerful ones, we think, are either ones that are directed toward amyloid or directed toward stopping neurofibrillary tangles, the other hallmark of the disease. They're, they're in here later. Um, short answer is, in big observational studies, People who take statins have a lower, much lower risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. There are two trials, neither one of which is published yet, one of uh, atorvastatin and the other of uh, simvastatin, Zocor and, Lip and Lipitor, in mild to moderate AD, for which we had great hopes, and neither one of them worked. So it may be that the statins may have an effect. There's a whole bunch of things it may do. Cholesterol metabolism affects amyloid metabolism. Uh, there are effects on LRP that may help removal of amyloid from the brain. There's four different reasons statins may help Alzheimer's disease, but it looks as if if it's going to get its traction, it probably has to be before the disease is early on. The studies that showed that it worked in population said if you were watching people in a big group in Rotterdam or in New York or in western Pennsylvania, and they were taking the drugs in their 50s and 60s, that they had a lower risk of getting the disease when they got older. And in fact, one study from Rotterdam said that uh, uh, you had to be on them for a certain amount of time before they'd help. 
So we have not done a prevention trial with them, although I would love to do that. It's expensive, it would take a long time. But in the trials to see would they work in people with the disease, the answer appears to be no, at least with uh, uh, Zocor and, uh, and Lipitor. Very disappointing. The, in fact, Pfizer did the uh, Lipitor study, as you might imagine. That study's been over for a while. They have not published the data yet. So the blockade is stop the first bad snipper so that the good snipper could work. Stop the second bad snipper. These are called secretase inhibitors or beta secretase inhibitors and gamma secretase inhibitors for the two specific ones. We got a million gamma secretase inhibitors. Some are in trials. I'll show you those. So far, only one beta secretase inhibitor has made it out of the laboratory and is in phase one trials. You could use anti-aggregation things, block this, the little individual molecules from, from glomming together. First drug to try that didn't work, failed and was announced last year, but there are others on the way. You could try to stop the plaque, and there's where a huge amount of work is being done now, to take the plaque apart. Or you could try to stop the aggregation at a point midway between having a single molecule and a big glob. All of these are directed at trying to interfere with the metabolism and the downward cascade. So here are all of the, uh, the, the global sorts of things. These are disease-modifying strategies. There's a lot of oxidative stress, a lot of inflammation in the brains of Alzheimer patients. So lots of antioxidants, lots of anti-inflammatories, lots of failures. These are the ones that are still currently underway. Resveratrol, that's the active ingredient in red wine. Uh, the current notation is to get enough to help you, as they have been helped in the experimental models, is a cool 55 bottles a day. <laughs> It's kind of like trying to get bladder cancer like the rats did from saccharin. You'd have to drink like 80 cases of tab a day, which maybe is worth it. I don't know. I kind of like tab. But, um, so resveratrol in a tablet uh, is, is the study that's underway. by. That's one of the NIH-funded studies, by the way. We, we dole out our NIH monies to do these studies very carefully because we don't have enough to do all the trials we'd like to do. Omega-3s, the fish oils, look like they have some potential benefit. Other fish oils. Rage inhibitors, not what you think. Uh, although, watching the Who's Loose in the 12th yesterday, I needed one. Today. But today's another day. Vascular risk factors. Here's where the statins come in. Uh, because there is a, every cardiac risk factor is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Every one. Lipids, hypertension, uh, different types of lipids vascular change, lack of exercise, girth, uh, every single one is a separate risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and we're, we're not sure exactly why. So these, the statins haven't worked, uh, at least in mild to moderate AD. There are a number of other kinds of trials looking at vascular risk factors, all of which ought to be done anyway, uh, because uh, obviously they would have benefits for cardiac disease. Inclu increasing or improving glucose utilization, uh, there are some data from short, small studies. Rosaglitazone is the one in trial now. That's Avandia, for those of you who know about its use in diabetes. Th this study, of course, would be for people who don't have diabetes. And then, as I said, the, the anti-amyloid trials and the anti-tau uh, uh, strategies, which I'll show you. Active immunotherapy and passive immunotherapy. These are all directed at putting antibodies onto amyloid and forcing it to be dragged out of the body. So active immunotherapy is what you may have heard about with an Alzheimer's vaccine, where they actually injected the 1 to 42 molecule in the humans. Uh, and I'll show you some of the data from that. Passive immunotherapy is you make antibody, and then you put it in intravenously. And you have to keep doing it every couple of months, because it doesn't last ter terribly long. Gamma secretase inhibitors, Lily's got one that's in a phase 3 trial. Now, phase 3 trial is the last trial you do before FDA approval. If the study works, you take it to the FDA. If it's safe. The FDA will look at the safety, they'll look at the efficacy, how well the drug worked, and decide whether or not you can market the drug. But they've got their gamma uh, in, uh, all the way out to phase three. And then there are a host of other things that are being done that we just call non-immunologic agents. Sequester it, uh, block it, uh, uh, alter its metabolism so it doesn't make a 42, it makes a 37, kind of a, uh, a, uh, you know, a wimped out uh, amyloid that doesn't bother anything. And, uh, uh, Dimabon is a mitochondrial uh, function enhancer, we think, and rage receptor blocker. The rage receptor facilitates the fibrillization of amyloid, kind of helps it on its way. So the idea is if you block it, you can stop it. Transtech Pharma, 
uh, had this drug called TTP-488. I, I consulted with them about eight or nine years ago when they were just bringing it out. It looked interesting. Uh, Pfizer bought it last year uh, just as it was going into phase three trials. So they took a calculated risk. They didn't have a drug of their own in phase three, so now they do. These are the anti-neurofibrillary tangle drugs, and, and these drugs are hard to develop because there are no animal models for them, unlike the fact that we, have, we can take human amyloid mutated genes from humans who get familial AD, put them into mice, and they'll make plaque. They won't make tangles because mouse tau is different than human tau, but they'll make plaque, and then you can experiment with them to see how you can pull things out. But we don't have a model for, for tangles. You just got to get lucky. And two of them are in play now. A third one it may be on its way. Rember or methylene blue, it turns out, had some almost too good to be true data presented at the international meetings last year, and now it's in a big phase three trial to see whether or not it's going to uh, uh, advance further. Uh, they were on one dose only, remarkable progress on this. You don't need to read the details here. If you want them, I'll give them to you later. But uh, the data looked impressive in culture. The data looked impressive in their phase three trial from the one dose, I think the 60 mig, yeah, the 60 milligram three times a day. And NP12 is a, an inhibitor of the, of the enzyme that puts uh, phosphate groups onto normal tau protein and makes it into the bad compound. Uh, this is from a company in Spain called Nocera. Uh, and uh, uh, full disclosure, I do consult for them, although I haven't done so for the last two years. And this one's in phase two trials in Spain. The third one is a drug called NAVSIPQ. They, they need a, or AL-108. They, they need a marketing guy. Uh, and this is a very small peptide that you actually spray up your nose. And it has some reason that it may block uh, formation of tangles as well. Uh, there's not a lot of data on this, but it's been around for a long. It was developed at NIH, and they just won't give up on it. So we'll see. Well, it's had a failure or two. We'll see whether or not uh, this 12-week uh, trial shows any change. One of the things that I wanted to put in here to tell you about is something you are going to hear about and see and go, what is this all about? And these are uh, foods, medical foods, that are grass, generally recognized as safe. This is a, this is a, a um, let me say something politically correct here. This is a bit of a wedge in the, in the wall between, in America, you can sell whatever you want if somebody will buy it. And to get a drug approved for prescription use by the FDA, uh, you've got to show in double-blind placebo-controlled trials that it's efficacious, and you have to show that it's safe. Then there is this category of medical foods, which would be like you would give some kids with uh, phenylketonuria or PKU uh, foods that are free of the uh, phenylketone. So this is the, um, the drug. Th this is in that category that they're trying to show is effective in slowing down the progression of Alzheimer's disease, but so far have not done. What they can say is it's full of really good things that, that theoretically should be helpful in Alzheimer's disease. In fact, this one's full of a bunch of things that have been tested by the Alzheimer's disease cooperative study and have not actually worked, uh, but they haven't definitively been proven not to work. So there is a trial of these going on now uh, in the U.S., uh, and Europe, uh, one site in, Europe, in the U.S., and now they're going to do another large trial. But you're going to start hearing about these. This is a Nestle's, yeah, this is a Nestle uh, Food Corporation European uh, uh, concoction called Souvenade. And they have some data that says GDAD patients did a bit better. Uh, but uh, they predict a giant market for this. I predict that they are correct. Uh, and it won't be because it will have proof that it works. It will be because, you know, desperate diseases call for desperate measures. Uh, and this is going to put uh, most, for those of you who are physicians uh, or who are involved in healthcare, this is going to put us in a very awkward position, especially if it's expensive, which I keep praying to Phil Shelton's and his colleagues not to make too expensive because people are going to take this out of desperation. The last thing I wanted to show you was what happens when you use these anti-amyloid drugs in brains. And that is about 10 years ago now, I told you there were mice who make plaque in the brain if you put the human gene into them and charge it up so it's working all the time. And you get plaque. So up in the upper left-hand corner is a mouse brain with mouse plaque. If you take that animal and inject him from age six weeks, every six weeks, with the beta amyloid, the 1 to 42, he makes antibodies to the 1 to 42. And that's what he looks like at the end of uh, a year. He has virtually no plaque in his brain. If you take an animal 
and let them live to be a year old and then start every six-week injections, if you didn't treat them, this is what he would look like. This is how much plaque he would have. But these animals begun on plaque injections had this at 18 months of age, a regression from what they already had, not to mention a, a, a block in it going further. So this went right into human trials, a randomized parallel group double blind study of 375 people in the US and nine sites in the United States, uh, in Europe and nine sites in the US. And about a year in, the study was stopped because of uh, encephalitis that showed up in about 5%, 18 out of the 300 people who, who were in the active phase, 75 people got the uh, placebo. And it happened because um, what you aim for when you immunize somebody is to have their antibody-making cells called B cells make antibody, but you don't want the T cells, which are the killer cells, uh, which are a little rougher uh, to, to get activated. We now know that that molecule had parts that activate the T, not just the B. Uh, it didn't show up in the safety trials, interestingly enough. That was probably statistical, but it showed up here. And uh, this is just an example. The white spotty stuff you see shouldn't be there. Everybody recovered. Uh, there were a couple of people who weren't quite as well off when they, when they recovered as they had been when they started, but everybody got better. No one died of the encephalitis. However, when the first person died, it was clear that they had amyloid, who had gotten active drug, it was very clear that they had amyloid removed from their brain. And so this is a, a high power view here of the patient, the first patient who died that Roger Nichol reported in 2003, and that's what a comparable case of somebody same age with same level of AD would look like. This is a lower power, that's a, a, a person with regular AD. This is this person, you can see it's all gone from their cortex, there still is some in the lower levels. So now 12 people have died. We've looked at four of these cases in my lab. Not only is it very clear that they're missing amyloid, but you can actually see holes in the tissue where the plaque used to be, where the amyloid's going. So like mice, we can get it out. But because the study was stopped, we don't know whether removing amyloid is going to be beneficial or not. And that will be the question that will be answered by the infusion study, um, several infusion studies over the next couple of years. Uh, presumably the first of those will be done within two years, and everybody's got their fingers crossed that there'll be some kind of signal that says if you pull amyloid out, you can slow the disease down. It's conceivable that if we, even if you pull it out, that the, the snowball is rolling and you can't stop it. But it certainly would be useful to be able to do that, especially because now we are able, with that imaging agent that I told you about, to detect people who are developing the disease probably years before they will develop it. Um, and I think... I think I'll stop with this example of how we would do that. This is your over on the right. This is your MR scan. You actually have less atrophy than this 70-year-old, I'm quite sure. But you can see there's no activity here on this PET scan of amyloid. And here's a 70-year-old patient with an MR scan, and it isn't subtle when somebody has the plaque in their brain. So for studies that are going on now and beginning, virtually everybody is using some kind of amyloid detection on scan so that you don't have to wait until someone dies to find out whether or not your drug has been effective in removing it. The question of whether for this particular type of uh, therapy and hope for the future, removing this will lead to a slowing down, or if we're really lucky, a cessation. Uh, probably won't be that lucky, but slowing down would be good, is the question that we are really trying to answer. And I'll stop there.